us in this room have never even arisen. We've come into the knowledge of Jesus Christ, but we've never come into our full design. We've never come into the full call that God has in mind for us because we've had so much discouragement, so much disappointment. We have become dream shy, and we would rather not try than try and fail. How many of you know that the enemy doesn't just hate you, but he hates your dreams and he will do anything to try and discourage you and keep you from building for the kingdom? Well, I also have experienced that and God has taught me a number of tips and tricks to just kind of stay in that space of encouragement, that determination that I'm going to build. And I share those with you in this message, Overcoming Discouragement. Here we go. I'm to you this morning about overcoming discouragement. Um, it's really just kind of near and dear to my heart because I work with so many people, you know, I work in the counseling arena, but I also work in the life coaching arena. And in those sex, a lot of times we're working with somebody who is feeling called to build something. I often tell people the difference between the counseling and the coaching is counseling. We're looking at your past. We're taking a look at anchors that keep you from moving forward. Whereas with coaching, we're taking a look at your future. Where is my destiny? How do I begin to build to move forward? And so in looking at those kinds of things, a lot of what we face is the the excitement of a vision, the excitement of a dream, feeling the stir when God calls you to build something, but then also facing discouragement. Now, we know that the scripture addresses discouragement a lot, which we can feel confident in that knowing it is not unique to me that I face discouragement, that sometimes I feel discouragement, sometimes I experience discouragement. So when we have an invitation to build, the energy and the excitement that we first experience, getting that vision placed before us, feeling that call, feeling the stirring of the Lord, it's easy for us to shoot out of the gates. The passion keeps us moving forward. In Ezra chapter 1, that the spirit of the Lord stirred King Cyrus. And he stirs the pagan king's heart to invite back the people of God to go and build the temple. Verse 5, it says, they arose. And so there was this invitation, and they arose, and they went back, and they built. Now, I want to talk about this word arose for a minute. When people arose in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, when it says, and they arose, they got up, it's not just the idea of getting up. It is also the idea to come about, to emerge to stand up. Now, in the Hebrew, it denotes the idea of existing. I'm going to say that again. Because when God invites us to do something and we respond by saying, I'm going to rise up, it means I'm coming into an existence. It also denotes the idea of to come onto the scene or to come into yourself. So what I want to propose to you is when you're being invited to build something, it's not just about what you're building, but it's about you coming onto the scene. It's about who you are becoming. It's about the full development of your design and who God has called you to be. Now, I would like to propose to you that some of us never even responded to the invitation of the Holy Spirit because we want to avoid failure. We want to avoid disappointment. We want to avoid discouragement. Nobody likes to lose in the room. None of us want to lose. But what is happening in those moments, if we connect the dots, is to avoid the invitation is to miss out on your fullness. It's to miss out on the identity that God is trying to develop in your life. To never arise or step to the invitation means I'm going to stay off the scene. Remember, to arise means I'm going to come on to the scene. I'm going to come into an existence. And the enemy wants to keep you seated on the bench. He does not want you to come into the existence of who you are called to be. He certainly doesn't want you to come into the fullness of your design. He does not want you to discover your full capacity. But instead, he wants you to stay seated and off the scene. So it's important that we recognize that when we're called to build, it's not just about what you're building. It's about who you're becoming. And so it is through our building that we discover who we are, what we are made of. And if we never build, we will never discover our capacity. We will never discover our capacity. In James 1, 2 through 4, it says this. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. What? When you face the testing of your faith. Because it produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. 
So what we're hearing here is, as we are beginning to build, I'm going to face opposition. You can bet it. And it is through the opposition that God is developing me. He is maturing me because he is not willing that I would be incomplete. But rather, he is ever increasing his person in me. So if I choose not to build because I want to avoid disappointment, I want to avoid discouragement, I am missing out on the maturity of the kingdom in me. So I want you to really get this because we have to have an understanding of why it is important that we begin to build to begin with. Because some of us in this room have never even arisen. We've come into the knowledge of Jesus Christ, but we've never come into our full design. We've never come into the full call that God has in mind for us because we've had so much discouragement, so much disappointment. We have become dream shy. I'm going to say that again. We have become dream shy, and we would rather not try than try and fail. And the Bible refers to those people as the people who have faith but no work, and they say your faith is dead in James chapter 2. Remember, he says if you have a faith but you don't have a work, then your faith is dead. You want to know why? Because you're not on the scene. The devil has deemed you irrelevant because you're not causing a fuss to his kingdom. And so we have to really recognize that that part of building is discouragement. We are going to face that. This should not shock us, but we have to decide it doesn't matter. I'm going to build. Now, let me give you the definition of discouragement. The definition means to be deprived of courage, confidence, or hope. Now, let me break it down. Courage is the ability to do something that frightens you. Okay, so in other words, discourage means I'm being deprived of the ability to do something in the face of fear. Again, this is not a feeling. This is my identity because God says I've called you. I've called you to walk in courage. I've called you to walk forward in spite of fear. I've called you to do it anyway, even though you're facing opposition. The word confidence is the feeling or belief that one can rely on someone or something. So the confidence that I have as a believer is that I can rely on Christ. I can rely on the empowerment of the Holy Ghost. I can rely on the blood of Jesus in the face of anything. But discouragement means I've been deprived of that confidence. In other words, I'm not sure I can rely on Jesus. I'm not sure I've been empowered to walk through this. That's what it means to be discouraged. And hope is the feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. So these are more than just a feeling. They are, these are the essence of our identity. Confidence, courage, and hope. That's what makes us believers. And discourage is, discouragement means I'm being deprived of those things. In the Old Testament, to discourage means to weaken your hands. Why? Because now you won't build. I need my hands to build. So if you take a look at the word courage or to encourage, in the Hebrew, it's the idea of strengthening hands. Remember in Hebrews, it says, raise up your your weakened hands and strengthen your feeble knees. He's talking about the encouragement of confidence, courage, and hope that we as believers are given through the empowerment of the Holy Ghost. That is the essence of who we are. Now, I want want you to think about Galatians 6, 9. It says, do not grow weary in well-doing or faint-hearted. That faint-heartedness is the idea of losing heart, to lose your emotion, to lose your passion for the thing you are doing. In other words, my heart is no longer in it. When I talked about when we're starting to build, there's this excitement. There's this passion that we have, and won't you know it, that excitement or that passion is going to wane. And if we continue to rely on only my soulish emotion... You can bet that that emotion is going to wane, and I will grow faint-hearted. This should not shock us. So what I want to do is I want to talk about how do we prevent getting in a state of discouragement? How do I begin, if I know I'm called to build something, and I know that it is going to be the enemy's number one goal to weaken my hands, what can I do to be proactive, to put on the armor of God so that When the day of trial comes, I will stand. How can I know that? Let's roll that clip for me real quick. 
my TikTok. And until he says stop posting on my TikTok, I will persevere mm-hmm. in that. Because he said the word once. So when God said, let there be light, he didn't have to every day wake up and go, well, let there still be light. He doesn't have to interact with creation, have a secret meeting to go, do we want there to be light today or not? Let there be. God, should we still be light? Should there still be light? And he's like, no, when I said it, I meant it. And you should persevere in it until I say, let there not be light. And so I think that's where a lot of believers miss out on what God wants to do in their lives because we we get faint-hearted and we grow weary in well-doing. And the well-doing is do what God said. Go back to that place where you know what God said to do and are you still doing it? And if you're not, is it because, only because you heard God say, stop doing it? Or is it because you got discouraged, you didn't see a response, you didn't see fruit, or are you continuing in it? And it's so beautiful because there's a, again, there's a freedom in that predetermination that's like, "Ah, God said to do this. I'm not going to look for a response. And I think that's where I'm at, where it's like, oh my God, this is exactly what God has said is going to happen. He's like, why are you surprised? I'm like, well, because I stopped looking for that. I stopped looking for the reward of 17,000 followers on TikTok or the reward of people wanting me to travel. I stopped looking for that. And at the end of the day, that's great, but it's an overflow of what I'm getting in my closet. And that is, I'm doing what God has asked me to do. And if I never saw him, that's what Abraham said. The Bible says he died believing, having faith, but never seeing. Yeah. That's crazy. Amen. All right, just a little nugget from TikTok. Uh, But actually, that interview is what inspired this message because he talked about, he asked me, what keeps you from getting discouraged when you're building? And so I began to really think about what does keep me from getting discouraged. And it's not that I never get discouraged, but it's that I know that's one of the number one things that the enemy is going to use to try and keep me from building. And I know it's really not about what I'm building. Y'all, it's not about the TikTok. It's about who I'm becoming and what he's building in me. It's about me coming into the fullness of my capacity. I don't know about you, but I want to stand before God someday and go, man, I wish I would have. What if I could have? What if I might have? And all of a sudden begin to discover the fullness of the kingdom and the empowerment of the Holy Ghost and go, God, I had no idea I could have. And that's what the enemy wants to keep you from really even recognizing your full capacity. And so I want to talk about some act. I really want you to walk away today feeling equipped. There are times when I'm like, I want you to feel empowered. I want you to feel excited. But today I want you to see me trip on that. And today I want you to feel equipped. I've All right, so I want us to talk about some really practical things. So number one, write this down. Predetermine that you will persevere. And that word predetermine is super important because it's like, and I've already decided. And I, I allude to that in this passage where I'm like, when God said, let there be light. He didn't have to have a meeting with creation all day and go, should we continue being light? And God's like, no, when I said it, you'll continue in it until I tell you to stop. And you have to have that kind of determination. You have to predetermine. I know the enemy is going to try and weaken my hands. He's going to try and steal my confidence. He's going to try and steal my hope. He's going to try and cut in on my courage. And he's going to want me to stop building. And so I have decided. Everybody say, I have decided. I have decided I will build. I have decided I will build. So you have to predetermine that you will persevere. Now, I want to read this definition of perseverance to you. It includes the idea of continuing in a thing despite opposition or its challenges. It is a persistency and therefore a consistency. I'm going to say that again because some of us are looking for some consistency in our lives and we don't realize that your consistency will be birthed out of your own persistency. It's a real tongue twister, I know. But it is your persistency when you predetermined, I will persist in this, I will persevere in this, therefore I will be a consistent believer in Christ. In other words, I will not be like the waves tossed back and forth by the winds of the sea. That's what it says in James chapter 1 as well. It goes on to say, if you predetermine that you're going to ask God for wisdom, he will give it to you generously, to all, without finding fault. And you will be a man who is stout. You will not be like the man who is double-minded and tossed back and forth by the waves of the sea. They're keeping up with me. And so that is why we, that perseverance, that predetermining basically is like, I'm going to be stubborn for what God has told me to do. And until I hear him stop, it's interesting to me how people are like, well, I'm going to try it. Wait, did God tell you to do it or not? Because if he told you to do it, don't, if you go in with the mindset that I'm going to try it, in other words, I'm going to try it and see what, hap- what kind of response I get instead of I'm going to do it because God said to do it. 
So don't try what God says to do. Do what God says to do. A synonym for the word perseverance is the word dedication. In other words, I'm dedicated to what God has invited me to do. And the Bible says, whatever you do, do it heartily as unto what? Unto the Lord, not the world. In other words, I'm going to do it as unto the Lord, and I'm going to watch how the Lord responds. I'm going to feel the pleasures of the kingdom, which is going to be part number two. We're talking about the reward of the Lord. I'm going to feel the pleasures of the kingdom. I'm not looking for the pleasures of the world. And I have decided in my closet I will continue in this until I hear God say stop. You must decide that ahead of time. You must decide that ahead of time. In Hebrews 12, 2, 2 through 3, and this kind of segues into my second point, which is look for the pleasures or the reward of the Lord. Hebrews 12, 2 through 3 says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, this whole passage could be a message in and of itself. If you follow me on Patreon, we're doing this as our devotional right now. On Hebrews 12, 2 through 3, it says, Therefore, we also, since we are crowded by, surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Now, let me pause here, because the devil wants you to feel like you are alone in all things. Isn't it true that discouragement comes with loneliness and loneliness comes with discouragement? And God is saying you are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Therefore, lay aside everything that so easily entangles you, every weight that weighs you down. Come on. Everything that you're looking at to fill you with unction. And it says, and everything that ensnares you and let you run with endurance. That's that same word as perseverance. You're going to run. Everybody say restore the run. Come on, say it again like you mean it. God, restore my run. You're going to run with an endurance the race that was set before you, not your neighbor's race, not yesterday's race, not tomorrow's race, but the race that God has given you for today, the race that you predetermined you would run in, and you're going to continue. And it goes on in verse 2, and it says, looking unto Jesus. Now listen to me. It says, the author of your faith. The author there means he was my motivator. He was my incentive. He was the first thing that sparked this in me. And he's also the finisher. And the question is, what is incentivizing you? So if we move on to recognizing that we must be looking for the pleasures or the reward of the Lord. In other words, I am incentivized only by the person of Jesus Christ. I'm not incentivized by what I see around me. I'm not incentivized by my husband patting me on the back and saying, nice work, babe. I'm not incentivized by that click or that follow or that like. I'm not incentivized by those things. I am incentivized by the person of Jesus Christ. He is the one who motivates me. You know why? Because he started this work in me. He's the author. He's the beginning, and only he can finish it. You cannot finish it. Your neighbor cannot finish it. Your spouse cannot finish it. Your boss cannot finish it. Jesus started it, and he will finish it. The Bible says he is faithful. He is faithful to complete all that he begins. You don't know why? Because he's not a man who lies. He does not relent, nor does he repent. In other words, he does not change his mind. When he said it, he meant it. And if he says it, you better believe it. And you better predetermine, I will continue until he stops saying it, I will continue in it. I will continue in it. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven six. 6, in case you didn't get point two, it's we're looking for the pleasures of the Lord. I'm actively looking for the reward of God. We need an accolade. That's our humanity. That's okay. The problem is we're looking for the accolade of the world and not the accolade, accolade in your closet. And that's why I said that, and I think, look, the fact that all this stuff is happening, I'm like, oh, and people are like, well, that's what God said. I'm like, yeah, but I quit looking for that. I came to a place where I loved the pleasures of the Lord in my kingdom, and I don't care that any of this is happening. It doesn't matter to me because it's no longer my incentive. It's not my motive. It's not my desire. My desire is to please the Lord. So in Hebrews eleven six, 6, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And there are times when I go into my closet and I'm like, God, I need a reward. God, I need, to, I need to know. I need to feel. I need to sense that you see the efforts that I've put in today. Because nobody else has noticed, and I don't see any reward of my work. I see no fruit of my labor. It feels like everything I'm doing is in vain. Am I the only one? No. feels like everything I'm doing is in vain. If I don't get a reward, and this, this verse has encouraged me to say, don't leave until you get it. 
You hold on because if you earnestly seek him, and I remember a time in my life when I was like, I'm not leaving this spot until I hear from you. That's what Jacob did when he wrestled with the angel of the Lord and he said, I won't let you go. I won't let you go until you bless me because you said, you said this would be my land. You promised. See, he wasn't making up something to wrestle for. He was simply holding God to his word. God, you said, and I'm not leaving until you bless me. I'm not leaving until I feel the pleasure. But don't look for the response of your efforts. Don't look for the response of your work. Rather, look for the reward of the Lord and determine to live in the blessing and the favors of obedience. I'm going to say that again. You've got to determine that there is a reward and blessings and favor in obedience. Because that's what the scripture says. Deuteronomy 28, first half is all about, if you walk in the, in, the, in the likeness of my word, you will be overtaken. You will be the head always, never the tail. You will be above, never below. Your kneading bowl will always be full. It goes on and on and on and talks about all the favor when you're walking in obedience. And I think we're so, we have dismissed the power of simple obedience. And just saying, today I will continue to do what God told me to do because he told me to do it. And it feels ridiculous. Come on, has it ever felt ridiculous? It feels like it's in vain. It feels like nobody sees, nobody cares. This feels dumb. But when we learn to recognize that there's favor in obedience and we allow that favor to be our reward, we will become even more incentivized by who? Jesus. We'll be even more incentivized. The Bible says in Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I don't need any other reward. I don't need any other accolade. I don't need anybody else to tell me good job. I don't need to hear anything from anybody else. You want to know why? Because it's the Lord that is my shepherd. He is the one who is out in front of me. He is my first concern. He is my incentive. He is my reward. He is my motive. He is my God. And I have no other need for anything. I shall not want. That's what the psalmist was saying. What do I need from this world when God is my shepherd? What do I need from my neighbor when God is my shepherd? What do I need from my spouse when God is my shepherd? What do I need from my children when God is my shepherd? What do I need from my work when God is my shepherd? Because if God is really my shepherd, I have no other need. I have no other want. I'm incentivized by nothing else except for God. Psalm 1611 says this, Instead, you direct me on the path that leads into a beautiful life. This is David who's hiding in a cave while he's trying to respond to the call in his life and a man is chasing him down trying to kill him but he stays focused and determined in his closet where he says you direct me on a path that leads me to a beautiful life as I walk with you I have pleasures that are never ending I have pleasures forevermore and he says for in this place I know true joy and contentment How many of you know discontentment and discouragement? You might as well just intertwine them. We call them the D words in the counseling room. Depression, disappointment, discouragement, destruction, all these words. Discontentment. And they're completely counterintuitive to who we're called to be. All right, point number three. Keep worship at the center. Now, I'm going to make three points here about worship. One, I want to make sure you get these points, but I'm going to go back and talk to them. Worship keeps you centered on your identity. Two, Worship keeps you focused on God. No brainer. Three, worship is your spiritual weapon. It is an act of warfare. Okay, so let's talk about these three. One, worship keeps you centered on your identity. Now, I'm going to go back to that story in Ezra. And it's interesting, we have verse chapter, in, chap, in chapter 3, verse 3, there it is, 3-3, three, three, Ezra 3-3, three, three, it says this, though fear had come upon them, meaning the people of God, when they were building Though fear had come upon them, their response was that they set the altar on its bases. And they began to offer burnt offering to the Lord, both morning and evening, all these burnt offerings. We learned two things from this. One, they had to look to their original place of worship. In other words, we have to go back to our original identity. So it says that they restored the altar that was on its bases. In other words, I want you to get a visual of a temple that is ruined. So they're having to move some rubble around to find the original place of worship. And some of us need to move some rubble around in our lives and go back to our original place of worship. We need to remember who we are, not just in a moment, but day and night, day and night. So we learned too, they worshiped continuously. 
This was a continuum. The very first thing they did, the first thing before the foundation was laid, they restored the altar. And we learn from that the priority and the necessity of worship when we're building. See, they knew we can't build until we restore our worship. And they set it on its bases. In other words, going back to that original place, remembering and rediscovering that the altar of God is within you. I was reminded we were reading uh, 1 Kings on Friday night. <clears throat> you were in 17. I jumped to 18 where it talks about... Um, Elijah, that's the guy's name, Elijah the prophet, and he says to the prophets of Baal, let's go up to the, to the mountain and let's have a rumble. And you build your, your altar and I'll build my altar. You call out to your God and I'll call out to my God. And it was interesting to me, fascinating to me, that when it was time for Elijah to build his altar, it says that he took the 12 stones that were laid in ruin. In other words, there was the original altar right next to the people who were calling on a false god. It was right there. See, he didn't have to come up with something to build. The, the raw materials for the building of the altar were right at his hand. And so he restored the altar, the 12 stones, representing one of every, every of the tribe. But it was fascinating to me to think, how many of us are right over here, the altar of the Lord, and we're like, God, slashing ourselves, exhausted, crawling out to all our false gods and feeling very depleted, weary, and exhausted. Remember, it says they wearied themselves. They wearied themselves, calling on a false god. And some of us are weary, we're faint-hearted, we're discouraged because you've been calling out to a false god to respond to your work. And God is saying today, the altar of the Lord is right there. Find it, rebuild it, restore it. And stay on it. Number two, God keeps us focused on, or worship keeps us focused on him. Psalm 16, 8 and 9, I'm going to go on. It says this, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, listen to this, I will not be moved. In other words, I won't be shaken. Because I'm focused on God. Why? Because he's my reward. He's my incentive. I've become stubborn for the call. Come on, some of us need to get stubborn for the call in our lives. It goes on and it says this, Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. The, vo rejoices. the voice says it like this, I will bless the God, I will bless God whose wise teaching orchestrates the days and centers my mind at night. Come on, come on, I need you to get a visual of this. We do, y'all are going to be like, this is so weird. We do some a little bit, sometimes when I have clients who have a lot of anxiety and have a hard time focusing in a moment. While I'm praying over them, I will tap them on the head. Just to kind of pull that energy right here. Just, I just want you to focus as you begin to say, I am okay because God is with me. The peace of God is in me, whatever it is that they need to hear. But it's the idea of centering them in a moment. And this passage is saying, see, David was saying, I don't care what's going on around me because I'm focused on a God who orchestrates my days and centers my mind at night. He is ever present with me at all times. He goes before me. Therefore, I will not fear, nor will I abandon my calling. I'm not making up something. To, I'm literally reading scripture to you guys in case you forgot. Because he stands at my right hand. So there it is, the altar of the Lord right here. But wherever everyone, I'm so tired. I'm just exhausted. I've been doing this all over. I've been trying to obey for two days. Two days. I did it two days. I did it two weeks. Come on, you were laughing because we know it's true, right? Because we give up because we're so weak because we have not predetermined that I'm going to persevere. I'm going to watch for the reward of the Lord and I'm going to worship my way through it. I'm going to worship my way through my breakthrough. I'm going to go on to the spiritual act of warfare. Worship makes a noise that alerts the devil. I'm going to say that again in case Ellie didn't hear it. Worship makes a noise that alerts the devil. And we need to learn how to ambush Satan with a song. I don't care if you can sing or you can't sing. But you need to learn how to ambush Satan with a song. This is what Jehoshaphat did in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. When it came to battling the enemy, he, appoints his, he did not appoint his frontline troops. Instead, instead, instead he appointed an orchestra. He appointed a choir. Instead of singers... He aims to conquer the devil with a choir. Come on, somebody says, I'm going to conquer the devil with a choir. 
Well, you got a choir inside of you, and I don't care if you can sing or not sing. The reality is, if Satan's coming after you, you need to learn how to ambush him with a song. Because it's not just about you worshiping, it's about you pushing the devil back. And what we learn is that is your worship in, literally causes confusion to fall upon the devil. And what is he trying to do? He's trying to confuse you. He's trying to discourage you. He's trying to get your eye off of God. And if you know nothing else in a moment, you start singing your heart out. I don't care if it's Jesus loves me, this I know. for the, I mean, whatever it is, you begin to sing and know that your song is ambushed. It is alerting the devil that you are coming back onto the scene. You almost had me. I almost slipped back into non-existence, but I started to sing a song, and then I came back onto the sing, saw the scene that quick. That quick. So I'm going to go on to the final one, and these are very practical tools. This is from a life coaching perspective. You've got to keep the vision fresh. Don't let it get stale. And here are four ways to do that. One, you write it down. Write it down. I have a friend who's like, I don't like to write it down because then I can't unwrite it. I can't unwrite it. I can't unsee it. Once I speak it, I can't unspeak it. And I'm like, that's the whole point. That is the whole point. You've let the devil know I'm serious about this. Serious enough that I don't care if somebody else reads my journal and sees it. The Bible says in Habakkuk 2, 2 through 3, write it down, write the vision, make it plain on the tab tablets. Why? So that the herald can run with it. I believe the herald is the Holy Spirit in you. He is the one who runs with you. He is the swift maker in your life. He is the promise keeper in your life. And so he may run with it, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. In other words, don't be surprised when it takes a minute. If you didn't see my last message, it was reaping and sowing. In other words, we sow in a season, we reap in a different season. So don't expect you're going to sow today and reap tomorrow. You know, we live in a microwave society, and that's what we expect. But he says the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end, it will speak. It will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Number two, declare. Keep speaking the vision of God. Keep speaking the vision to God and to yourself. Two things. Speak it to God. Speak it to yourself. The Bible says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And I am afraid that a lot of times we talk to spirit, discouraging talks to us. We even go to the Lord with all of our discouragement. And we spend our entire 20 minutes talking about all the things that are lacking in my life and all the things I need. Instead of speaking into the spirit and saying, but this is what you say. And I'm going to come before you and I'm going to spend my 20 minutes with God saying, we're in agreement, right? Because you said, so I'm not leaving this spot until you bless me, until you affirm me, until you confirm me, until I feel an accolade from the spirit. I'm not leaving my closet because you said. So we're speaking it to yourself. You're speaking it to God. Point three is this, imagine. We've talked about that quite a bit lately. Practice your vision in the spirit. That takes a lot of courage. But remember, to be encouraged, we're filled with the encouragement of the Lord means I have the courage of the kingdom. I'm confident in what God has told me to do. So I am courageous enough that I'm going to begin to practice my vision in the spirit. I'm going to give my imagination as a writing tablet to the Holy Ghost. I'm going to take it back from the devil. Come on. Because a lot of us are already imagining all the different ways I could fail. Oh, but what if I don't have enough money? And We're very good at imagining all our failures and all the ways the glass is half empty. But God says, if you would give me your imagination, I'll show you the overflow of the Spirit. I will show you things you have not seen. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, if you seek me with your whole heart, I will be found by you. And it goes on, it says this, and I will show you things you have not known. In other words, things you could not come up with on your own. In the message, it says this, things that are walled about. They've been hidden from you. But in the spirit, I have a desire to reveal the great unimaginable things to you. Give me your imagination. And this is intentional. We have to intentionally, I do this a lot also with my clients. I don't just have them pray about it. I'm like, and then I want you to sit and imagine it. And they're like, what? No, I want you to sit and play it out in your mind. I want you to see yourself doing the thing. And killing it at it. Come on, this is how Olympus make it to Olympia, to the, what do they call it? Thank you, the Olympics. You're no help. <laughs> we always blame everything on the husband, right? Um, so that's how the Olympus make it to the Olympics, is they see themselves sticking it, landing it, winning it. They see themselves with a goal. They will tell you what is one of the things. To the same degree that we get on the mat and we practice it, 
We also imagine ourselves sticking it, landing it, doing it. They will tell you that's one of the number one tips and tricks of Olympus is they spend just as much time imagining as they do physically engaging. But we don't do that as believers. We do, but we're doing it with the devil. We do, but we're doing it with the devil. And finally this, tell a friend and talk about it. Now, I want to say this. Make sure you tell a friend who's going to believe in your vision. When I first started having a vision for Crazy 8 Ministries, I was in a denominational church, and I started talking about it, and they were like, well, if it's the Lord's will. Well, so you're just going to put a bio together? You think you're going to be a speaker? Like, have you spoken anywhere before? You, know, you think that's kind of... Well, just be careful. You don't get too arrogant. I heard that a gazillion times because I was trying to be confident and begin to speak things that didn't yet exist into an existence, and I was accused of being angry. That's what David, David said. When David said, I'll fight Goliath, he saw what hadn't already happened. He already imagined himself. I bet you, I bet you, when he fought the lion and the bear, he was envisioning himself fighting the enemy. He had already seen it in his mind. So when it happened, he was quick to be like, oh, I'll fight him. If you're spending time imagining yourself laying hands on people and they're being healed, when somebody needs healing, guess how much quicker you'll be to do it? Because you've already seen it in your mind and you've seen yourself doing it. You've seen yourself doing it. So we must imagine, tell a friend and talk about it. That was where I was at, sorry. Tell a friend and talk about it. Be willing to talk about it. Get a friend who's willing to talk about it with you. If I can get the worship team back up. So find somebody, an accountability partner. Get yourself a life coach. I have a life coach. I love life coaches because I need encouragement. And I want somebody who's going to come alongside me, my dreams and my vision. Somebody that can talk about the hairy, audacious dreams that I have. They're big right? And really recognizing the importance of finding a friend, telling a friend, and talking about it. And that also takes a lot of courage. Because sometimes you might tell the wrong friend who's like, <clears throat> but you know what? If somebody doesn't laugh at your dream, I would like to propose to you that it's probably not big enough. If you don't have somebody that laughs at your dream, it's probably not big enough. And I'm not talking about the people that matter. My mom used to always say, people who mind don't really matter. But the people who really matter don't mind. Right? So she used to always say that. And I'm like, hey, find the people who don't really mind because those are the ones who matter. But the people who mind are like, Ugh. they don't really matter. And you're going to have to be willing to leave some of those people behind to run with the vision. To run with the vision. And, and this isn't in my notes, but I'm just going to say it from my own personal experience. Not, everybody's, no, no, not everybody can handle where God is taking you. I know there are people on my team today who will not be with me five years from now because they cannot handle it. And that breaks my heart. But I have two choices. I can keep running or I can quit. And I've already predetermined, y'all. I've already decided I'm going to keep running. I'm going to keep running because my identity is at stake. The work of the kingdom is at stake. You've got to determine what is at stake. You are at stake. Your work is at stake. Your full capacity is at stake. And therefore, the impression and the influence and the mark that God has called you to leave in this lifetime is at stake. Oh, I'll leave anybody behind. You put it that way, I'll leave anybody behind. Because I'm so distracted by my destiny. Come on, we talk about distraction a lot. Sometimes Brad and I are trying to have a conversation about the here and now, and I feel like he's a party pooper because he's trying to talk about the realities. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm distracted by my destiny. And that's not a slam to him. It's just an example, right? Sometimes people are trying to talk, and there are times that I'm like, okay, I'm distracted by my dream right now. I can't see what's happening in reality because I'm so distracted by what God just showed me in my closet. And I know it doesn't seem real to you, but it seems real to me. You want to know why? Because I've been practicing it in my closet. And that's how you prevent discouragement in your life. So the voices are like, what? Excuse me? Excuse me? I love when they come to Jesus and they're like, this woman, this, this woman. And it says that Jesus bent down. He began to draw in the sand as though he didn't hear them. See, he was distracted by the Father. That was the only focus that he had. He couldn't hear the voices of those around him because he was so focused on the Father. He was incentivized by his Father. His motive was God. It wasn't pleasing the people around him, and it was as if he did not hear them.